Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's Mike Harvey again with Cimarron Firearms Company, bringing you another tale of the making of the Cimarron Collection. Sitting beside me here is Charles Hudson, who had a hell of a lot to do with the making of that collection. Charles worked for me for 40 years, and and uh, just almost all that collection was uh, was the dealing was done by Charles. The paying was done by me, but uh, he made some hell of a deals over the years. And this is probably one of the best ones and by far the most interesting. Pull that up and to the camera there and let them see it. This is a seven and a half inch Colt single action army nickel plated with ivory grips. It's a 44 Colt Frontier six shooter. And it, we believe, was once owned by the most colorful pistolier Texas has ever known. Everybody thinks that was John Wesley Harden, but it wasn't. This guy was a good looking dude. He lived in the roughest part of Texas at the roughest time that that part of Texas has seen. And in Texas, it's called the Nueces Strip. And the Nueces Strip was the most lawless area in the whole state for years and years. It took, a, it took an army of Texas Rangers to go down and bring peace to that area. Well, before they did that, King Fisher uh, rode herd over that part of the state of Texas. And uh, I don't know how he got his name King, but it might have been because he was the king of the New Aces Strip. And he was a true Texas pistolier. He was fast on the draw. He killed several men defending himself and in gunfights he never lost. And uh, he could shoot left-handed, right-handed, both-handed and he could empty both of his pistols. He'd grab a Winchester lever action and kill some more. I mean, he was unbelievable with a gun. And the banditos in that part of Texas at that time feared King Fisher. They were scared to death of King Fisher. If they heard that King Fisher was in the area, they packed up and went back to Mexico, which didn't help them because he went right into Mexico after them. But anyway, he was a colorful guy. The Mexican population loved him. And on the Texas side, the, uh, the Texas population loved him. And most of this happened right after the Civil War. And uh, that area had had many years while the war was going on to really get rough. And, uh, and King Fisher ruled that area, made a lot of money, stealing back stolen property and uh, building his own empire down around Uvalde, Texas. And uh, this is a story of the acquisition of the gun that we believe once belonged to King Fisher. And Charles was working our store back then. We had a little retail store called Bigfoot and Charles was working in a store and I worked downtown Houston at a bank. <coughs> and uh, so anyhow, Charles, uh, spoke to the gentleman that brought this into the store and, and Charles will describe the gentleman and the conversation that he had with him and and uh, and all of that. So I'll turn it over to Charles. Well, this gentleman came in our store. He uh, told me he was one of the main guys in Uvalde in the uh, he was a judge of U Valley at that time when he was came in the store he was retired at that point and he had this gun I didn't see this gun he actually had it in a, in a bag a old whiskey bag that he wadded up and had the barrel twisted on it and I didn't even see the gun and he told me that uh, it was a gun that I'd want to have and he was going to tell me the story so he started on the story he told me this they dug up uh, King Fisher's grave in the night because they were moving it. And uh, 
the police officer there, he shined a light. It had a little uh, porthole in the coffin. Glass. Glass porthole. And he shined the light in there and noticed he saw this gun in that coffin. There were also two other guns that they noticed in the coffin. So it was in the middle of the night when they were moving this t uh, casket. So they decided to take the guns out of the casket and take them to the station that night. So he ended up with the gun, uh, the police officer. And uh, he had it for 30 some odd years whenever they dug up that grave. It was done in the early 50s, if I remember right. And uh, he gave it to the judge to sell for him. And that's when he brought it in the store. And then the judge told me this story. And he said, you can call him, but he's not gonna admit that he took it out of the, the casket. But he was gonna tell me if I called him, he traded it for a bag of airheads. But the judge was there and he told me he actually witnessed him taking this gun out of that coffin. So he showed me who he was. I knew he had a card to say who he was at that time. and. I had, of course, driver's, driver's license to pay a thousand. He wanted a thousand dollars even before I saw this gun. So when he told me this story, I love Texas and Texas history, and I knew Mike definitely loves Texas history and Texas. Anything to his Texas, Mike's in for. So I said, Mike's got to have this gun. So uh, I told him we'd give him the thousand dollars for it, but I'd have to figure out where I'm going to get that thousand dollars. We had, we had. A hundred dollars in the cash register and that was it you know my daughter Jamie had just been born just before this <clears throat> and uh, Mary Lou and I we were stone broke and so where are we gonna come up with a thousand dollars now <clears throat> this is in 1980 in 1980 you could buy a great Colt in great condition for five hundred dollars. Now this one was a thousand dollars. That's like more money than God has, isn't it? <laughs> you know. Anyway, a thousand dollars was a lot of money to me. And uh, but we came up with it. We found money here, there, and yonder, and and borrowed and loaned and everything, and <clears throat> we got a thousand dollars and and bought this gun. There was a third guy at the, at the, when the guns were removed from the casket, he was a, a, a city official. <clears throat> and he actually, <laughs> the sheriff removed the guns, but they ended up in possession of this, this, uh, this other guy was a, some big city official. And they probably, it was the middle of the night, and they couldn't leave the guns there unattended so uh <coughs> so uh evidently they took the guns with them but the guns never went back you know and uh the judge guy was uh uh well i got my information from a different source than charles did because <coughs> I'll let Charles tell you, he called my wife, Mary Lou, and she was at home and uh, with a newborn baby, and and he told Mary Lou about this and told Mary Lou he needed to get a thousand dollars. So uh, I know how that went over, but I'll let Tar Charles tell you about that, and then I'll tell you a little more. Well, Mary Lou said, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she said to me. No, no, no. <laughs> I, said, I, said, I said, we got to get this gun. There's no way I can let this gun leave. <laughs> so I told her the story. I told her it was the famous gunfighter, King Fisher's gun. And the judge, he told me without fail it was his gun. And I believed him. And I still do because... We have more information after all this went down, but I had to have the gun, so 
we had Mary Lou went to Mike and Mike I don't know why Mary Lou didn't tell Mike the whole story so Mike got this story later but told me somebody different other than me he didn't even know I knew all this story but I did that's because he told me the story yeah Charles <laughs> Charles knew all the story of what he just told you but Charles was so excited <laughs> He told Mary Lou about it belonging to King Fisher, but <laughs> he didn't tell me. He told me it belonged to the law officer, you know, and uh, you're gonna have to call him. <laughs> and 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 that I needed to call him and find out and ask him about the history of the gun. So that's what I did. I called. He was the chief of police at that time and his name was Vance Chisholm. And I called Vance Chisholm, he's gone now, but he was alive then. I called him and talked to him, he was really nice. And Vance Chisholm told me that, uh, that he didn't know anything about the history of the gun, but he said, I've had that gun since back in the 50s. And he said, uh, all I remember about the gun is I traded a bag of rare arrowheads for it. So that's all I knew about the gun, is I had a gun that was at least worth a bag of rare arrowheads. And so I said, man, that's great, you know, but it's a great gun. And uh, then uh, I took the gun, I put it in the safe, and that's where it stayed for 25 years, in a safe, sitting there. Then, in 1998 or 99, we moved to Fredericksburg and opened up the store, Texas Jack, downtown. And uh, that was Cimarron's showroom. So we had all our Cimarron's in there. So everybody loved old guns. They would come in there and just, you know, look at all the Cimarron's in there. And, and uh, uh, so one of our customers was a reporter for well, he worked at the library at this time, but during the during the the grave uh, moving days, they moved the grave. They had to move the grave because they were building a new highway through town, and King Fisher's grave was not where it was supposed to be. It was actually on the highway right away, so they had to get it off of the right away. So they had to move it, and so in the process of moving it, it got opened. The grave was solid iron. His grave was iron with this glass window in the top of it. And they said when they looked in that window, there he was dressed in his leopard skin chaps. He was a flamboyant, good looking guy. He dressed in his leopard skin chaps. They said you could see the bullet holes where he was shot and uh, uh, the guns were there. And uh, what else? I, I guess that's all about the about the casket. But anyway, they had to move the casket, and then moving it, it, it opened. So they opened it up, and then took the guns. I think to keep them safe, you know, because you couldn't leave them in the ca open casket out there all night. But anyway, uh, that's the reason all of that happened. Uh, we're gonna have to pause here a minute while I remember where the hell I was. Cut that. Cimarron is recognized as the leader in quality and authenticity in replica firearms. Hey, kid, never sneak up on a man's camp. Sorry, part. I smelled that coffee in. Hey, is that a Cimarron? For those who know the difference, what's it to you? I've got a Cimarron, too. It's got superior fit and finish. The highest standards. Cimarron is the choice for you. Tell your dealer. I want a Cimarron. Okay, I was in our I was in our retail store that we had just opened a new store, Texas Jacks in Fredericksburg, and uh, and this this guy comes in and he is uh, uh, he is uh, he works at the library, but he has a Boy Scout troop, and they make beaded Indian beaded gauntlets and possible bags and stuff like that. For sale to raise money for their scout troop to go on trips and stuff. 
So he was in there with a bunch of goods and we bought uh, all of his leather goods that the Boy Scouts had done and we sold it in the store. But, but I was talking to him and just making conversation. I said, uh, I uh, keep in mind that Charles forgot to tell me anything about this gun belonging to King Fisher. <laughs> and and I'm thinking that this gun was traded for a, a bag of airheads was traded for this gun and that's all I know about it. so I'm talking to this guy and he says uh, uh, I said I've got a I've got a gun that came from from Uvalde and he said you do he said where'd you get it I said I bought it from Vance Chisholm and he leaned back like this he said it's not a seven and a half inch nickel plated Colt 44 with ivory grips, is it? And when he said that, I got a chill and like the, I could feel a hair on the back of my neck stand up. I mean, I got a chill that, that uh, he knew about this gun. He said, he said that gun disappeared when they opened King Fisher's grave back in the 50s. And he said, I was a reporter for the newspaper when that happened. <clears throat> so he goes to telling me all the stuff that Charles just told me. The judge's name, the Indian airhead collector that Vance said he traded, to, that he gave the airheads for the gun. And all of that, this guy stands there and tells me the whole story. And, I've, and Charles never told me. So I thought, man, this is a scoop. So I got on the phone to Charles right then and said, Charles, God, the newspaper guy from Uvalde was just here, you know, with the beadwork. And, and I said, he told me the whole story about that that gun was, was disappeared from the grave whenever King Fisher's grave was opened back in the 50s. And Charles says, well, I know all of that. He told me all about it. And I said, what are you talking about? He told you about it. You never told me in all these years, you've never said that to me. You never told me about that. He said, oh, I thought I told you. <laughs> I thought I told you. I said, no, you didn't tell me. So anyway, as it turned out, it uh, I got pretty excited about that then. But uh, anyway, uh, from there, we've just taken good care of the gun and... and uh, Talking about the book that came out that actually had photographs of the coffin. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they, they wrote a book that has a, uh, has a picture of the coffin and all this information about that in the book. I have a book about Ben Thompson and, 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 and King Fisher, but it doesn't it doesn't uh, cover that but it showed the coffin i thought it was unusual it showed the picture of the coffin in the book and there that there was that glass see few yeah you're doing in that coffin just like he told me it was i was i was real surprised when that book came out and saw that coffin because exactly what he ascribed to me what the coffin looked like so that just verified more of the information to me that the story was true but the judge swore it was true from the get-go, and that's the only reason this gun's here is because of the story he told me. Anyway, that's, uh, that's another piece of the Cimarron collection, so I guess we ought to make a replica of it, so, you know, a replica of King Fisher's gun, so all the pistoliers out there will have something to shoot. You're going to go... He's you're going to get the letter from Colt for this, right? And see what yeah, I hadn't got a letter from Colt. We called Colt one time just to see when it was made and all, and they gave us the information, but I need to get the letter and see if there's any more out there that's known about it. <clears throat> Sometimes if they go back for repairs or something, Colt would make a note of it, and they still have that information. But, but anyway, thank you for listening, and... Uh, we're going to sign off now, right off into the sunset and all that kind of stuff. See you next time.